Good evening, everybody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, one thing I will say is that this um, lecture is about to be live streamed, or it's currently being live streamed. Um, I believe we had 52 people sign up online to watch this. So if I could ask you to turn your mobiles um, onto silent or, or mute or off, that would be great. So we live in a, a world with changing technologies, uh, technologies that change what we do, uh, how we operate, and, and how we engage. In fact, I was um, uh, on LinkedIn this morning and, and saw a, an article from Rolls-Royce to say that they're planning on uh, crewless ships by 2020. Um, so have you ever wondered what the president in the year 2100 is going to look back on? Well, in memory of Lord Kelvin, uh, one of the first presidents of the Institute, uh, the IMRS has established a series of lectures to reflect upon his achievements and his vision. Lord Kelvin achieved worldwide <coughs> fame in the sphere of pure science and was equally successful in the application um, of his knowledge of physics and practical uses. Among his numerous inventions, uh, those by which he will be chiefly remembered by the maritime community, uh, are his patent ship's compass and sea sounding apparatus, now universally uh, adopted. The IMRS Lord Kelvin lecture, um, a series of lectures, are given by distinguished um, uh, members of the maritime community, taking Lord Kelvin's foresight and applying that um, and the development in future technologies. So it really is with special uh, excitement tonight that I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Frank Mungo. Uh, Frank has been involved with the IMRS for 20 years and he himself was president of the Institute in 2013. <coughs> His education at King's College Taunton preceded him joining the Royal Navy in 1965 as an engineer officer. After undergoing general training and obtaining a degree uh, at the Royal Naval Engineering College, he specialised in submarine and nuclear engineering and served in two nuclear and one conventional submarines. He was the Business Development Director for Rolls-Royce Naval Marine Business from 1998 to 2006 and he was responsible for the strategic planning and positioning the entire marine product and system range in the naval market. Today, Frank is the Managing Director of Egeria Consulting, concentrating on project management, naval propulsion system analysis and development and conference management. He currently sits on the IMRS Board of Trustees uh, within his role as the Honorary Treasurer and has been Chairman of the Foresight Marine Panel, the World Maritime Technology Congress, the UK Economic Exclusion Zone Industry Group and was a member of the British Naval Equipment Association Council. He's heavily involved in the running of INEC Asia, which of course we're, we're running uh, in May this year alongside the, the Singapore Navy uh, Index. Tonight, Frank is going to talk about um, what the IMRS president in the year 2100 is going to look back on. So I think a fascinating topic. So please join me in welcoming Frank Mungo to deliver tonight's Lord Kelvin lecture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and those listening at home, um, welcome. Thank you for coming. A long time ago, as IMRS president, I had to present to uh, a fair few audiences the changing backdrop against which maritime institutes must operate, the challenges this set us, and how we at the IMRS have been responding. This set me thinking about what some of the future issues might be and whether our recent initiatives had positioned us to respond to them. And that set me pondering further about the future in general. An easy state of mind for me to slip into. You've heard something of my CV from David, so there's two reasons. <clears throat> Much more so, I have a natural predilection for daydreaming rather than getting on with the boring present. So I set myself the task of imagining what the far off future might look like and what the implications for the maritime sector might be. And I devised the conceit of describing this in the context of an address by the IMRS president at the turn of the next century. In addition to being a satisfyingly round number, a hundred years away sets it rather beyond too much argument. Much of that imagining was sufficiently timeless to bear repetition, although I do apologize to those of you who are old enough to remember the original version of this. 
Uh, it's going to be light-hearted, certainly, fantastical to some of you, I'm sure, but it's meant to provoke some thought about the challenges that we do face over the next hundred years. Oh, and I ought to nod to the other holders of the franchise looking back to the future, I think. So, come with me now on a journey into the year 2100, through time, and imagine the IMRS president of the day, a marine engineer, as she gives her presidential address, uh, um, and piece out my imperfections with your thoughts, suspend disbelief, and imagine the President's Day in 2100. And it starts something like fellow marine professionals. As we sit at the turn of the 22nd century, I thought it would be useful and entertaining if I reviewed the last 100 years of marine engineering in very broad terms. I intend no slight on marine scientists. Some of my best friends are marine scientists nor am I ignoring the tremendous contribution they make um, to the world around us. However, I don't feel that I can add to or complete, compete with my illustrious predecessor, the marine scientist who gave the talk last year. <clears throat> Let me start with the birthright from which our institute grew. Sorry, there's a delay on this, which is slightly unnerving. Um, ship propulsion for a variety of different vessels. My re research has found this old slide in the archives, which was used to illustrate the technological changes in ships and propulsion over the first 200 years of the Institute. And we've updated it to reflect the present day. Remember the main threads that moved us from steam recip through turbinia to steam turbines, and then diesels, gas turbines, and nuclear. And we've added fuel cells in the last 50 years. From direct drive, again through turbinia, to gearing, then electrical drive, and from propellers, initially fixed pitch and then controllable pitch, to water jets and pods, to today's rim-driven propulsors and submerged water jets, with pulsed membranes and magnetic drive just around the corner. I'll come back to some of the detail later, but first I want to look at the broader background against which these changes have taken place and of course to cover some of the other branches of marine engineering as we see it today. <clears throat> the barriers for change in our industry are timeless and although cultural to an extent they revolve around cost to varying different degrees. All technological advancement requires development to take it from a scientific idea to a mature and usable reality. The early stages of development are relatively cheap and the latter stages low risk with the goal in sight. It's the full scale proving in the middle of development that is usually very expensive and risky. In a highly competitive industry, the shipbuilders will not willingly incur non-recurring expenditure and will always prefer to build more of the same and ship owners will not willingly incur, incur additional risk and potential cost, and who can blame them? <clears throat> As technological change always requires a driving imperative. The first imperative is cost itself. If there's a business case to be made, then investment to reduce cost, provided the risk is reasonably low, becomes a no-brainer. A new market opportunity will also attract the entrepreneur to invest, again provided the risk is tolerable. And of course in our world it's often the military who fund the initial development to meet a perceived need, think steam turbines, gas turbines and nuclear propulsion. While the next two drivers, population and economic growth, did not of themselves drive the need for change, they did, as we shall see, provide increases in scale which gave new market opportunities and new potential for real cost reduction. Environmental sustainability is more difficult to justify as a driver since it brings little obvious benefit to the entrepreneur and usually carries a significant cost burden to the ship owner and the shipbuilder. 
Nevertheless, it became increasingly obvious during the course of the 21st century that it could not be ignored. Some strong leadership from key nations and other authorities drove the introduction of legislation and regulation, which required major technological change, backed up by tariffs, which made the cost of non-compliance prohibitive. Let's now examine some of these in more detail. I thought it would be instructive as well as amusing to put up the population growth predictions from 100 years ago. They had a spread, of course, but their modelling wasn't too bad. <coughs> the reality is that today we have a world population of 12 billion. Mainly because of the underestimation of the effects on life expectancy of medical advances and the stubborn resistance of us oldies to the thought of altruistic euthanasia making room for more people on the planet. I myself am living proof that the age of 120 is the new middle age. More seriously, this has led to a vast increase in the consumption of resources, both directly, energy, food, consumable goods, and indirectly, materials for building and other infrastructure. Geopolitical changes have no direct bearing on marine engineering, but they do affect the patterns of world trade. We might have hoped that the foundation of Europa from the early beginnings of the European Union would create a superpower to rival the United States, but somehow it never succeeded in the face of the diversity and rivalry of its peoples and the general exhaustion of its energies. It's interesting to speculate why two even older cultures should have succeeded where Europa failed. I refer, of course, to China and India, which now rival the USA in all respects apart from per capita income. Perhaps it's that enduring hunger which fueled their national win, will to succeed and sustain it still. These superpowers, you will observe, are separated by either large tracts of ocean or for two of them, the insurmountable barrier of the Himalayas. <clears throat> it's also a truism that superpower stage of status leads to higher wages and consumerism and the transfer of manufacturing to lower wage economies. And of course, the raw materials often lie somewhere else entirely. Couple that with the inexorable rise in economic growth around the world, and it's hardly surprising that seaborne trade has continued to grow dramatically over the century. Although the hydrogen economy, to which I will return, has put an end to the transport of large quantities of oil and gas, it used to be up to 25% of seaborne trade, this was more than compensated for by the increase in consumer goods demand general, created by general increased prosperity. As to other forms of transport, beg your pardon, as to other forms of transport, there really was no other sensible alternative to shipping, especially in view of the increasing world population and consequent choking of land transport. In the early part of the century, green taxes on aircraft fuel, uh, the reluctance to build more runways, and increased ship speed saw some passengers shift from air to sea, but overall there was a reduction in all but recreational travel as the spectacular advances in image transmission made business travel all but redundant. But what of the sea itself? I guess we'll never know whether the dire predictions made at the end of the 20th century would ever have come true, because the world changed its pattern of behavior in the middle of this one. The observed rise in sea level in the last century is 50 centimeters, but the real causes are obscured or confused by changes in a variety of factors which might or might not be contributory. Firstly, the slow melting of the West Antarctic ice sheet as a relic of the end of the last ice age gives an inescapable 18 centimetres per century. There has been a reduction in solar activity in the latter half of this century compared to the last, and there have also been three major eruptions in the space of 20 years, one overdue, one expected, and one not expected, which added to the uncertainty. 
The real change, however, was in public attitudes in the United States. Of course, that country had developed an initial vision of the hydrogen economy under President Bush the Younger as far back as 2001. However, there was a growing unease, about, and there was also a growing unease about the potentially catastrophic, unstable consequences of global temperature rise, re releasing much of the 10,000 billion tons of methane hydrates locked in the seabed sediment and the permafrost, which then would reinforce the warming process with probabilities mm. as high as 10 to the minus 2. However, the real provoking event which changed the course, I think, of US perception were the 300 year storms in, in, in the 30s which hit Savannah and Charleston in the relatively quick succession and which caused thousands of deaths and polluted the local fresh water, ac water aquifers for some time after. It's impossible to determine whether these were caused by side effects of global warming or were mere meteorological freaks, but the end results were to change public perception of the threat in a way similarly to the terrorist events of 9-11. From that time, the most dynamic economy in the world became committed to moving on from the oil economy and the rise in greenhouse gases was brought under control. I'm tempted to add, and they all lived happily ever after. In retrospect, it's possible to identify three main periods in the last century in the transition of the energy economy from oil-based 100 years ago to today's decision, though of course there are no defined hard edges. In the first 30 years of the century, we concentrated on reducing carbon emissions by increasing efficiency of demand, particularly in the developed world, starting the transition from oil to gas, developing different forms of renewable energy generation and fuel cells, and moving towards localization of supply using distributed power systems and a more flexible grid to take advantage of these additional forms of generation. In the next 30 years and in the aftermath of the conversion of the USA and building on the early geothermal hydrogen economy experiments in Iceland, we made further demands, gains in demand efficiency, particularly in what had been previously known as the developing world, where there were still benefits to be obtained from this. We used carbon sequestration from fossil fuels at the generating source, together with a more widespread use of hydrogen, some of it generated in the sequestration process as a renewable energy storage and transport medium. In the last 40 years, we've developed a fully-fledged global hydrogen economy, albeit with a means of electrolytic production varying according to local circumstance between geothermal energy, solar energy, other renewable energy, and in some places steam reformation of fossil fuels. And what are the future? <coughs> While there are engineering solutions, hydrogen is still tricky and dangerous to store, transport, and refuel. The next step is likely to be the long day delayed to technology of fusion reactors, not least because they'll allow us to deal with some of the most pressing toxic industrial waste issues, particularly the residues from the first nuclear age. So much then for the geopolitical and technological backdrop to the last century. Now I'd like to move on to the elements of marine engineering embedded in all this. Let's first consider the development of renewable energy. There are, of course, many forms, and some, like biomass, relate solely to land use. Others, such as wind, solar, or geothermal energy, are appropriate for land or marine use, although the challenges in marine use are largely greater. And then there are the more constant marine tides and waves. All except solar and biomass have required us to make significant marine to let technological investment. Firstly, in underwater engineering to provide structural stability, and in the case of geothermal engineering, to create reliable subsea processes. Secondly, to optimize the extraction of energy from the source. 
thirdly, to collect and channel the generated electrical power, and finally, to provide a useful quality of power output from sources that are highly irregular or intermittent. All this was developed in the first 30 years of the century and entered the mainstream as distributed power generation, distributed power sources on a global basis became the normal. This technology was also linked to two other issues, which became increasingly relevant as the years rolled on. Firstly, sea defences. While the rise of 50 centimetres that I've described might seem moderate compared to the potential effects of greenhouse gases if they had remained unchecked, it still put an extra 70 million people at risk for frequent inundation. Not only is there an increased risk to people, but also to the freshwater aquifers from which some large cities draw their supplies, and to ecologically important wetlands. Building new sea barriers, or in some cases renewing those which were obsolete or ineffective, required judicious investment appraisal and was originally largely a matter of civil engineering. However, <coughs> in many areas it was found to be beneficial to include wave or tidal energy devices in those sea barriers, thus creating strong links to marine engineering. The other issue relates to the second precious global liquid, potable water, particularly in the equatorial belt. The previous century saw a six-fold increase in water demand, and worse was predict predicted for the last one. Several strategies were developed to deal with this, covering improved water management, increased storage, and a particular increased interest to us, local desalination coupled to renewable energy plant. In this last, the distributed nature of marine renewable energy sources, coupled with their intrinsic links to the sea, made them a natural partner for potable water production. This slide shows firstly the distribution of typical wave energies around the world on the top left, and secondly, the distribution of geothermal en energy. And there's one other technology I need to cover before returning to what our predecessors would have called the main marine engineering mainstream. The existence of metalliferous oxides and sulfides in the deep ocean has been known since well back in the previous century. And there was a brief, brief flurry of interest in extracting manganese, copper, nickel and cobalt in the 1980s, but founded on the economic effects of successive oil price rises. However, in the first half of this last century, commercial interest was rekindled by several factors. Firstly, the continued search for improved designs of most varieties of engine required increasingly sophisticated alloys. Secondly, one of the key hurdles in building the hydrogen economy has been the development of efficient and accessible static and mobile storage devices using novel metal hydrides. And thirdly, the continuing instability in some of the key source countries for these metals has engendered determination to ensure diversity of supply. A whole industry is therefore developed around the mining of metalliferous nodules at depths, depths of four to 5,000 meters and in crusts and muds at one to two and a half thousand meters in several parts of the world particularly the Eastern Pacific, the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, and various Atlantic deeps. The most widely used technique, uh, shown here, is a self-propelled crawling collector, which separates the elements of interest and sends them to the surface via a flexible riser, where they're processed in very large mining ships. Production's huge, 50% of current manganese use, and 100% of cobalt. And now, what used to be the core business for the Institute, ships and their propulsion? Firstly, I want to review the key drivers that affected ship propulsion technology in the 21st century. As ever, initial and operating costs were key determinants. However, more than ever before, these were affected by local, particularly Californian, 
national and international impositions to drive changes in the energy economy and the incentivization of the reduction in atmospheric emissions of all kinds. In addition to the fiscal and legal constraints on atmospheric and chemical aspects of environmental pressures, we have had to learn to consider noise as an issue, particularly in the context of marine life. And of course, we've long grown used to the idea that no fluid leakage of any sort, including ballast water, is environmentally acceptable. In passing along the way, some green idealists eventually learned that insisting on coolant inlet and outlet temperatures being equal to avoid heat contamination was against the laws of physics. Finally, although European legislation requiring disposability to be considered at the design stage has been with us for over 100 years, it's only recently that general international practice has caught up with this. Safety has always been a moral imperative, but it was the growing ability to enforce personal liability individually and corporately which gave it real teeth. Of course, in the ship sense, ship sense it also has strong links to avoidance of environmental accidents. <coughs> In reducing the less obvious operating costs, such as insurance, and the tightening of insurance regulation has probably played a major part in making clear the full cost of taking risks. Turning to unreliability, owners have always known that it cost them money, but had little sanction except to change supplier when the next order was due. Shipyards and suppliers probably also knew that it cost owners money, but had little incentive to do much about it, especially given the high premium of super reliability, until the widespread onset of long-term support contracts in the commercial shipping world, similar to those long used by airlines. I've listed power and power density separately there, although they are clearly linked, and stem from the requirement for ever larger ships and one end of the scale and even faster ships at the other and we shall see some examples shortly. Finally of course there's the matter of fuel where drivers have nearly always been linked to atmospheric emissions in one way or another. First there was the drive to avoid acid rain, the creation of SOX emission control areas, the use of high or low sulphur fuels and then there was the general move away from crudes towards distillates brief experiments with or emulsion, and then switch to natural gas. And now we have hydrogen, although we shall be wrestling with better ways to refuel from shore, but especially for navies at sea for some time to come. What about ship propulsion and its enabling technologies? With the general issue being that size of the marine market rarely justifies development to fulfill its needs alone, it thus has to rely on development from the automotive, air or land power generation sectors or in specific cases from naval development. The advent of the hydrogen economy of course demanded the development of diesels and gas turbines which would run off this fuel and incidentally remove one of the last remaining advantages of diesels over gas turbines. I would say that as an ex Rolls Royce man. The use of hydrogen as a maritime fuel has allowed shipping to benefit from the use of hydrogen fuel cells, but neither automotive nor energy developments of these devices have produced cells of sufficient power and power density for use as marine prime movers. And they're only used as auxiliary or harbour power sources. Solar cells are also used at sea today, but again don't provide sufficient power for main propulsion although they do provide minor increases in overall efficiency on passage. One of the key spin-offs from all the other three sectors, including the more electric aircraft, has been the ready availability of power-dense electrical machines, of particular use in high-powerful electric propulsion applications at sea. Another change, although it may seem minor, is the widespread use of active magnetic bearings, sounds trivial, but has contributed enormously to reduction in maintenance and, unreli and unreliability of mo rotating machines and large improvements in noise generation. 
I've mentioned it before, I'll come back to it, in terms of putting power into the water, we now have advanced propulsion technologies in the form of high power density pods, making full use of the motor and material technologies I described earlier. Rim-driven electric propulsors, which move the need for shaft. Submerged water jets with efficiency, efficiency characteristics, which bridge that between propellers and traditional water jets. And close to final development, pulsed membranes and magnetic drive. Uh, there are attempts to make biomimetic propulsion work properly, but I have my doubts. Finally, and often overlooked, there are increasingly varieties of sophisticated materials which enabled and underpinned the advancements I've just described. Heat pipes, shape shifters, self-monitoring, integrated power generation all come to mind. We should make a special mention of automation. Of course, it isn't just automation, but rather the full spectrum of options, from lean manning through to remote operation, through to single oversight of multiple platforms, before we get to true automation with no human intervention at all. There are obvious cost and resource benefits to reducing manning, and also some operational ones in specific applications. Full automation was being used as early as the first decade of the last century in research submarines, or the one shown at the bottom of this slide in the centre. They had the ability to carry out two-week exploratory missions under the Arctic ice and then retrace their steps, learning as they went. The military application was shown on the slide as well, some of it recognisable, I'm sure, to the audience, um, were obvious as well early on. However, it took considerable developmental effort before automation of large ships was acceptable. And even then, some literal states and most port authorities insisted on remote manning as an absolute minimum within their jurisdictions. There was also the major hurdle of demonstrating satisfactorily impenetrable cyber security to be overcome before we could all rest easy with full automation of large ships. But what are the vessels in which this, these technologies are now used? Back to the design drivers, no surprise. First again, inevitably, initial and operating cost. Although, as I've mentioned and hinted earlier, there have been distortions from fiscal initiatives used by governments to incentivize various national and global transport policies, now that we have some. Population growth, of course, and the increasing difficulty of creating congenial living space near the coast had two effects. One was to put harbour and port space at a premium, and the other was to drive governments to control road traffic, both, both personal and freight, and we shall examine the effects in a minute. Finally, I've touched on the inexorable increase in world trade over the succeeding centuries. This led to a pattern of ship use and development, which is probably oversimplified in this table. And here I should pause to pay tribute to Rolls Royce for the very early concept work in this field. The four main uses of shipping, shown horizontally, obviously excluding leisure, which is difficult to categorise. And against these are shown the four main ship types which have been developed recently, three of which have utility in more than one category. One defect of the table is it doesn't do justice to the full diversity of the ocean exploitation category, which clearly requires a wide variety of ship types. Now, what do I really mean by all this? It's probably easier to review it in a geographic visualisation. In order to cope with the drivers, the increased trade uh, and, and the, the need for land and the need to reduce traffic, the process of transporting goods has been developed and to illustrate these new ship types are used. Transocean trade is carried in one of two ship types. Firstly, the environmentally friendly mega freighter, which carries huge volumes of freight at relatively low speeds. 
and secondly, the high-speed ocean freighter, which carries small volumes of high-value time-sensitive goods at about 40 knots as a halfway house between sea trade and air freight. Both of these ocean freighters dock and offload at a sea hub well away from the coast, possibly something like a, or close to a, um, an old oil rig. At these sea hubs, the freight is broken down and loaded into fast feeder vessels, small agile craft which distribute the freight at high speed to a large number of small ports around the coast for local land delivery. The sea hub itself is a floating city with accommodation, leisure facilities, maybe even a fixed wing airport, and probably submarine docking facilities for exclusive economic zone exploration and exploitation. And it will often be sited near a fossil fuel source and will use, use steam reformation to generate hydrogen to refuel the shipping that is docked there. And such an integrated transport system has many advantages. It avoids the use of extensive port space on land in competition with domestic or amenity use. It allows mega freighters to stay away from coastlines and to dock safely. High speed ocean freighters can deploy their full speed for the maximum part of the journey. Land transport and operations are significantly reduced and fuel production is close to the point of use and away from land centers of population. So let's have a look at each ship type in turn. The floating city, shown here, can be a sea hub, but can also be an alternative to normal land-based cities <coughs> in areas of very high population density, or even to provide leisure second homes in a congenial climate for the significantly rich who can come and go by air. Obviously, mobility is possible, but limited. An alternative version of this, developed for military use, is the sea base. It's occasionally pressed into service, as you might imagine, when a low-lying area such as Bangladesh are in inundated by a storm surge or other flooding and it can be used for disaster relief relatively easily because it's mobile. Some suggestions are around that inhabitants, like Bangladeshi fishermen, might prefer the Spartan accommodation on there as sea levels rise to actually finding their huts are flooded. Next we come to the environmentally friendly mega freighter designed to carry very large volumes of cargo between sea hubs away from land at what would still be considered normal speeds, um, 20,000 TEU and beyond, bearing in mind we've already got 19,000 TEU um, at the turn of the century. <clears throat> away from the perils of land uh, and, at, as I said, at normal speeds. It's the perfect candidate for full automation with the facility of oversight when the circumstances demand. The ultra-fast ferry shown here, I haven't mentioned before, but it could just as easily be the fast freight feeder vessel, which I did describe before. It's based on a swath design, but with four hulls rather than two, and it's designed to keep traffic onto a coastal water highway and off increasingly congested land roads by feeding great bulk cargo to large numbers of coastal or even riverine distribution centers. And lastly, the high-speed freighter is designed to provide, as I said, fast ocean-going transport for high-value time-sensitive goods in competition with air freight. And as you will detect, it's based on a very early scale innovation <coughs> version of the turn of the last century US warship design. So, as I, can, as I finish, let me turn to the key challenges that the IMRS has had to overcome to remain one of the dominant maritime in in institutes at the dawn of the 22nd century. Firstly, we had to ensure that we played a major part in the development of underwater technology for exploration and exploitation of subsea resources. We had also to remain abreast of developments in the hydrogen economy 
so that we could understand the safe translation of this technology into the maritime environment. And then there's something I haven't really touched on in this um, talk so far, and that is to working with old and new engineering and maritime training establishments to ensure the availability of appropriately trained and professionally accredited resources for all the branches of marine engineering I've described. Finally, we had to stay relevant to the superpowers of today and the centres of maritime activity, both old and new. It was a considerable wrench leaving the old headquarters at one birdcage walk in London, which has served us so, so well for over 60 years, and it was quite hard to decide where to move next. But most members now agree, agree that the move to Singapore was sensible and, in hindsight, essential and we are at home here. Thank you for listening. And as the slightly overlong fade works, I'd be delighted to take questions. Don't harass me too much if you're an expert, because a lot of that was very fanciful. But it's the challenges that I really wanted to bring out. So, do we have any questions, thoughts, discussion? I don't need questions. Debate would be good. As we're being recorded, I think Susanna needs to bring you a microphone. Yeah, right. or... Thank you for this uh, very futuristic talk. And we know what's uh, going on. Uh, one of the things that I couldn't see very much, there will be a new frontier, most likely, of shipping in Arctic because of the global warming and how that will have an impact on design, on traffic, on the logistics. A lot of things has to grow in that area. Second thing is that the nuclear technology is nothing uh, new, it's old, but it's always getting improvements. Now how do you think that also will play a role in the uh, market ship? Okay. Um, the, the, the burden of my talk was that over the last 50 years, I mean between 2050 and 2100, we would have moved to a hydrogen economy. It seems to me that the main reason for interfering with the Arctic, despite considerable environmentalist pressures, is, to, is for oil exploration. Now, if we don't need the oil anymore, partly because we can use fracking or whatever, or we considerably reduce the consumption, I would doubt that in the latter half of the, this coming century, we will be doing very much in the Arctic. You mentioned global warming melting the ice, and you're quite right, but that merely makes it a normal sea lane rather than um, the need for ice breaking. Now, I'm sure there's some oil and gas people out there, either in this room, and I know Singapore has strong interests in the Arctic, or out listening online, who will probably be choking as I say this, but to be honest, if we don't have to interfere in those wild places, we probably shouldn't, and I can't see a commercial reason for doing so. The nuclear question is an interesting one, and I'm going to answer that as me rather than as the president. I have a four-sentence answer and a one-sentence answer, but I'll give you the four-sentence one. I used to be the design authority for 20 in-service nuclear reactor plants. In my time in that job, a problem arose which caused me to spend 60 million in year that I did not have to commit 200 million pounds in year so for future years that I did not have and which finally cost one and a half billion pounds to put right. Now, I don't know if there are any ship owners in the room. No? It, it is inconceivable that a ship owner would carry that contingency. The only player that I can see that could and would would be the Chinese government that owns the shipping, and they could bear that risk. Um, 
so my, my response really is if, if you feel that coming on, go into a dark room and lie down until the feeling passes. And, and that's flippant, but one is the, is, the, is the risk of things going wrong and the cash risk. The other thing is I still think that there would be a significant reluctance in many, many ports around the world for reasons which are not logical. Sometimes I wish we'd chosen different words for nuclear power and nuclear bombs, rather like the difference between napalm and petrol, you know, in which case the emotion wouldn't be there. But I still think it would be very difficult to get nuclear ships into many ports around the world. Perhaps in the context of sea hubs, then there might be some utility. But even so, the overheads of a nuclear power, as we know it, are enormous. Maybe the fusion reactor, I can't see that coming, but then again, um, did any of us see 4G mobile phones coming 20 years ago? So you may be right. Uh, I just think there's too much stacked against it. Thank you. Sorry, I, take, I saw you first. <clears throat> Being too young to remember when I was abolished, red zero crew. Sorry. When the minimum safe money certificate became zero? Um, I would guess that's probably about 30 years away. But okay. I, could, I believe it will come um, because people don't want to go to sea. It costs to send people to sea. By and large, you can only send low-wage people to sea, which means that they're not necessarily terribly expert. And with some of the technologies around, why would you ask them to do it? I grant you there's an awful lot of assurance to be done. We don't even have any uh, a body of class rules which cover automation yet. And, and, and just think of the things that... There'll be sort of six different channels of control communication. There'll be a large on-off switch which the Coast Guard can use if they want to get on board and stop something. There'll be different navigation lights to, to trivialise it. There'll be safety critical software involved somewhere which we don't have, cyber security <coughs> and a whole heap of demonstrations. But I strongly suspect that it will come. First will come unmanned. Then I think will come one captain ashore looking at three bridges, as long as the communications are strong enough. Uh, Is your response date 2017 or 2100? Somewhere between the two. It won't be 2017. So in 30 years? Yeah. From 2100? Oh no, sorry. Let's call it 2047, shall we? All right. Because th th there are unmanned ships at sea now, there are those automated submarines, and they are automated, because you can't communicate with them. So, and they learn, they, they, they find an ice cliff, and they go down until they find a way around it, and they remember the way back over two weeks. Now, that's today, so it, it will be feasible. Sorry, there was a question just then, sir. Yeah, uh, I just want to pick up from that question that uh, Arun left behind uh, about uh, nuclear propelled ships. I quite understand the concern with uranium as a fuel, as a fissile fuel. Uh, the, uh, there is an alternative. When I mean, fusion, you say it's a long way down. You know, on your timeline, it's like uh, 2100. Uh, I think that's a little bit uh, skeptical. Uh, it probably come around sooner. But before fusion comes around, I think that is the other alternative, thorium. I wondered if you were going to say that. And yes, I, my, my long term mentor, uh, Bob Hill, uh, gave a presentation on thorium reactors about two years ago. Yeah, uh, I think that shows a lot of promise. Uh, if you don't have this problem of uh, fallout, you don't have a meltdown, and thorium is abundant, 
and is cheap. So I think Tory could well you, be... You could well be right. You could yeah. well be right. It's, I don't, what I don't know, perhaps you do, is the infrastructure costs that it carries, not just the fuel, but the safety, and then there's also, as I said, the emotional aspects of the word, the word nuclear, which are not logical, but they are there, especially given what happened in Japan. Yeah. So if thorium was a fuel, then you really don't need to go into hydrogen, because you could, you know, hydrogen is still one step for the town to production. You could use thorium to propel the ship directly, can't you? Yes, you could. You but could. as I say, it has those issues which I mentioned. Anyway, let us see. Yeah. In fact, I'm proposing to write a paper for, for the uh, right, on the uh, thorium propelled ship that doesn't require any refueling. No, and as I say, I, there was a paper presented at INEC Europe about three years ago which proposed thorium to. Sorry, was, did I see another question? Sorry. On, on a totally unrelated and something that is not sexy reactors, um, there is a big issue with ships at sea, and that is fabric maintenance. What are we going to do if you have ships which are totally unmanned about fabric maintenance? Expecting a ship to run for five years with no maintenance on deck is a non starter. Doesn't it depend slightly on the materials? It depends on the coatings. And unless we get coatings that can cope, which we don't have, then we're not going to get this. So, so you add into the ingredients as a prerequisite for unmanning or even lean manning the development of coatings which allow ship husbandry to be a thing in the past. For, for example, I'm running a 25 year old ship, okay? It's got an awful, awful lot of energy tank. It's got an awful lot of superstructure which requires painting. Yeah. I've had to increase the crew complement by three just to cope with it. What does that cost as a matter of interest? About $90,000. Plus the cost of paint. Yeah, so, so somewhere there'll be an investment appraisal, I guess. That, that's the cheapest option we have at the moment. But in future, we need better coatings. So yes. anybody who makes coatings, there's money to be made. But thank you for that thought. Where are we going next? Uh, David, we're going to London, I think. Um, oh, right. Just had a good question that's come in. <coughs> With the growing population beyond 12 billion in 2100, have we begun looking to colonize the deep and start building cities in the sea? Well, that was partly my point about the, um, the, 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 the city ship with, with 40,000 people in it. And it's, it's probably getting too difficult to do it under the sea, although it, it should be possible, but stable floating offshore cities, especially in very high population density areas, I would have thought is an obvious way to expand. In a sense, you already see it around Dubai, don't you? It's not a floating, but it's it's building stuff out into the sea. So yes, um, I do. One at the back there. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm not entirely sure in which tense to actually address you. <laughs> um, Relaxed is better. Relaxed, okay. Um, you were actually commenting this on because you don't know how partial uh, old um, offshore hubs and the small high speed of ferries, which is the main main gauge in the coast country. So I would imagine there would be a larger volume of the smaller ferries. So looking at the kind of fleet that we have now, it's an it's not an ever increasing but aging fleet. And to do away with the current aging fleet and move over to numerous smaller vessels, how are we going to cope with the recycling and scrapping of our current fleet to move over to such a membership? Judging by what we do at the moment, we're going to tie, t t tow them to Piraeus and, and anchor them off Piraeus and leave them there forever to rot. Sorry, that, that's a cynical bit. But I mean, that. We, we don't recycle very well, do we? No. And, and that is, I think I mentioned disposability and disposability at the, at the design stage, which is a European law requirement, which doesn't affect Singapore. But 
Um, no, we, it, it, it's, it's another challenge, and, and yes, we're going to have to do that. But I mean, at the moment, what, what do we turn over ships at every 15 years? Is it life of the ship? Yeah. Do we scrap them all, or where do they go? Depends on the type. I mean, it's actually interesting because uh, with the advancing rates of human regulation and the fact that in this current state, um, uh, the global economy is not increasing that related to expecting it to increase, especially in the next 20 years. Um, the sort of driving motivating factor for owners to retain the current feet while still retaining the profit becomes quite challenging. So if the regulations move at the speed they are, and the fact that you know, public <coughs> interest in the environment in general is going to increase even more, that means there's less stimulus for the owner to actually invest in these new technologies, but they are shackled by actual regulations. So there is going to be a challenge for us in the future when it looks to the scrapping of the older vessels because it's inevitable. You can't move forward while still jagging the junk. I, I understand. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in the commercial shipping market, as will be obvious, but I, I think we've just established that, by and large, the life of a ship is 15 years. I observe that the life of a naval ship is 25 to 30 years for the first owner and probably another 20 years for the second owner. You know, there are, there are ex-naval frigates steaming around Argentina today, which are seriously old men. Um, so, but, but somehow or other, ship owners seem to change. Now, as I dimly understand this, there's a seven-year cycle in shipbuilding. And about every seven years, when they've got no orders, they seriously reduce their prices. And the ship owners go, oh, that looks good. I'll buy some of those, even if I don't. Have I got that roughly right? Yes. So, so there, is, there are all sorts of factors at, at play in ship owning shipbuilding. The, the real trouble, I suspect, and I, I alluded to it, will be getting ship owners and shipbuilders to invest in the new technology if they don't really have to. That, that will be the, the hump. This, um, uh, in, in naval terms, we call it technology readiness level, getting from, say, three to eight over the hump of full-scale demonstration. Who on earth is going to fund that? And I don't know. It may be navies. It may be um, China research centres or something. But it, your point's well made. I don't know how we'll get there. But any others? We've got another one from London. Um, this is from Martin Murphy. From him. Without doubt, the members of the institute have facilitated economic growth in the world. I remember that 85 years ago we had 20,000 members. How many do we have now, and what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, once we took over RENA, and that added another 8,000 members fairly quickly, and then the, um, the Asia Pacific Directors of the Day's initiative to generate extra membership in Shanghai. Uh, and, and the rest of China added an extra 10,000. So, um, to be honest, and, and, and of course, we increased the stickiness of the student members, so they all stayed on, became associate members, and then full members. So I would think 50,000 is not unreasonable, and that's a conservative estimate. What do you think the next award for the, uh, one of the student awards in terms of innovations going to look like? I think an excellent thing would be to fund their travel and subsistence while Yves de Lanier pays them a generous thing to be an intern with uh, Deep Blue for a while. I think that would be extraordinarily attractive to any student that I can think of. Any others? No? Oh, one there. You are all that, that standing between them and a drink, you know that. <laughs> so, and I have a question which is uh, opposite to advancement of shipping, is that if uh, we identify that there are two distinct roads of world trade, and uh, advancement of pipelines, for example, like the trans transocean pipelines, uh, will it actually reduce the need of shipping? 
What's going to flow in the pipelines? Well, I did wonder whether somebody was going to ask me whether um, uh, 3D printing <laughs> would, would kill freight transport, but I don't think so because we're always, you know, you can't 3D print one of them, can you? Um, pot potable water is one thing that we might flow with. I'm not sure about anything else, but if you think about the US to whatever source of um, whatever fluid it is you're thinking, that's an awful long pipeline and there's some very deep trenches. So I would have thought it's still going to be economic to use some form of sea freight. But that's just me, what do I know? Containers? Well, we already see 19,000 TEU, don't we? So. I mean, in the pipe. Oh, in the pipe. Ah, you mean rather like in the old days of, 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 of old-fashioned stores where you had air suction. In interesting. Wasn't there a Graham Greene novel about a vacuum cleaner part that he was, he was drawing which scared everybody because they thought it was for transporting matter? Yeah, you may be right. I personally doubt it. But um, that's just me. <coughs> China is now building this big. China is building that big uh, infrastructure across from from China to to the to Europe. You know, rail, uh, rail and roads. It was part of the uh, one belt, one road. Uh, what do they call it? Right. Yeah, to integrated transport policy, but yeah, and that could change. It oh, could. I understand that any kind of military trade. I wonder whether one railway line, and I understand it isn't run one railway line. There are changes of gauge all the way along. One railway line will carry the volume of the container shipping that currently goes from China to Europe. The other thing is, <coughs> how shall I put this? There are countries en route whose friendliness is not necessarily guaranteed, whereas by and large the sea is, is a free highway, apart from the Straits of Malacca where you get occasionally shot at. So I did notice that, and I also noticed that they're starting a route between China and India. What I can't see is the volume, is all. Especially if the population of the world has, what are we at now? Is it? Seven billion? Seven, seven. Yeah, so we're talking about nearly doubling with all that that implies. And uh, I, 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 I doubt we will keep up with the volume of freight, to be honest. But I'm sounding as though I'm convinced by my own logic. I'm, I'm aware, I must be careful, there are lots of other opinions out there. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, really, really good to talk. I mean, we'll, we can all kind of carry on the conversation afterwards. And uh, just as a bit of a token of appreciation, but I've got to thank you um, for all the presentation this evening. So, I do know what it is, and it's even older than I. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.